We're going to talk about purpose today. We're going to finish up 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And the, the picture there, I'll talk a little bit about it later. That's a goat in the background, a goat with horns. Um, but do you ever think about why you do the things that you do? Why you behave certain ways? Uh, maybe, maybe you have a certain way that you do your daily tasks. Maybe it's a habit that you've developed. Uh, maybe it's just the way you've been taught to do something. Maybe a, a superstition, so you do things in a certain order. Maybe you do things in a certain order in a certain way so that you don't forget something in that routine. You know, if you brush your teeth out of order, you forget to brush your teeth until you realize when you're already away from home and it's too late. I asked Amy, I shouldn't have, but I asked Amy if there were any, any little quirks or habits that I have that she doesn't really understand what the purpose behind them are. I thought maybe, you know, she'd take some time, get back with me in a few days. <laughs> she started rattling off way too many of these things. Uh, um, just a couple examples. Apparently, in Amy's mind, there's no right foot for socks, no, no correct foot. You can, they're interchangeable. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> there is a right sock and a left sock. Um, I, I make the coffee. Uh, because I want it to be done right. Uh, and, and apparently, I can have two identical mugs, and I can set them down. And Amy knows one of those identical mugs is not for her. And there's a specific one that's not for her, even though they're the same. And she doesn't understand what the purpose behind that is. But it's because one of them is mine, and one of them is hers. <laughs> I think we get into habits, and we forget why we do things that we do. We forget what the purpose is. And, and that can be a good thing, like in the case of a, um, a good thing, a, a routine that we set. Maybe we need to get out of that routine. If we do, we, we forget things. So having that set routine can be a good thing. And that can be a bad thing to get set in our ways because we forget the purpose behind what we're doing. For example, communion. If we get in a habit of communion and we don't stop to take time to consider what that means for us, that can be a bad thing. As we talk today, uh, as we look through this, this letter Paul wrote to Corinth, we're going to see that he's asking the Corinthian Christians to get out of their own way, to think about others first and to understand their purpose, and that that is to help the people around them know Christ. Let's pray, and we'll get started there in 1 Corinthians 10, starting with verse 23. God, thank you so much again for this church. Thank you that we can be here today and study your word. I pray you bless our time together, God, and help us each time we open the scriptures, no matter uh, how many times we read that, that passage. God, help us to, to see something new and understand something different that helps us do a better job at following you and being your church. Thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. We'll start off with just verses 23 and 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Just because you are allowed to do something or you are allowed to behave a certain way doesn't mean that you should. This past weekend was the men's retreat, and we just had a couple of guys go this year. Rob Padgett, Daniel Swaggard, and I went, and the topic this year was on anger. And the speaker spent his time, and he started off, he's saying, you know, there's some people in the church who think that you can justify righteous anger. And he said, when I look through the Bible, that's, that's the rare exception. When you look in the Bible at what the Bible has to say about our anger as humans... Anger is not a good thing for us. 98% of the time, and that's just a number I'm filling out. I didn't actually calculate each one. But most of the time, you look at anger in the Bible, it's not a good thing. The speaker spent the weekend explaining that idea. So, so to put that in the context of this passage, maybe it makes sense for you to be angry about something in your life because uh, someone treated you poorly or someone didn't do what you wanted them to do or because of their actions or their offensive words, but, but anger's not going to do you any good. Anger's not going to fix the situation. Anger's not going to edify. It's not going to improve the situation. All things are lawful. Not all things are profitable. Let no one seek his own good but that of his neighbor. Paul is trying to get the church to think of other people first, and this is tough. Paul wants us to work towards being the good, work towards the good of the people around us uh, above our own, and that's hard because... In our society, in our culture, you know, I want things my way. I've worked hard to get the schedule I have, the house I have, the whatever I have. That's my time, my stuff, my things. Paul wants us to work to help to the benefit of our neighbor first and foremost. But what about me? And, and it's hard to get out of that mentality. You might ask, well, okay, he wants us to help our neighbors. But then who is our neighbor? 
Well, you know, Jesus was asked that same question. I can concede that helping my friends, my church family, and, and that's a good thing, but who's my neighbor? So in, in, in Luke chapter 10, this is after Jesus sent some disciples out to, to do some things out in pairs to experience life a little bit. Comes back and he's talking to them and kind of teaching them and, and learning with them. And here in verse, chapter 10, verse 25, this, this lawyer, he's a Pharisee, and he stands up and he says, Teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus goes on and he says, well, what's written in the law? How, do you, how does it read to you? And I'm kind of I'm paraphrasing. I'm going through this passage. It's up on the screen for you. But the lawyer, he comes back and he answers what the scriptures say. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? He asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who is it that I'm, if I'm supposed to love my neighbor above myself, who's my neighbor? So Jesus then tells the story of the Good Samaritan. You might be familiar with the story, a guy going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among some robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and took all his stuff and left him basically for dead there on the side of the road. So, so this priest comes by. Well, good. You, you read the story, you think, good, a priest is coming. Surely the priest is going to, no. He crosses over to the other side of the road because I'm sure he's got an appointment he's got to get to that's much more important than helping this bruised, battered man on the side of the road. Well, okay, well, this Levite comes along. Well, Levite, they're good, quality, upstanding people. Surely the Levite, nope, the Levite does the same thing, but then a Samaritan. Now, in this point in Israel's history, the Samaritans, they didn't get along with the Jews very well at all. In fact, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. They would go out of their way to not come in contact with these Samaritans, but the Samaritans saw the man laying there. He stopped and he helped him, took care of his wounds, put him on his own, his own donkey and took him into town, put him up in a hotel, paid the fees and said to the innkeeper, anything, anything else that you need, if you have any other expenses to take care of this man because he needs some help, I'll come back and I'll, I'll, I'll pay you back what you spend above what I've already given you. And Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? He said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. So who does Jesus tell this lawyer his neighbor is? He says, everyone, even the people that you don't like are your neighbor. You should be caring and you should be compassionate to tell them. So Paul's saying, whatever you do, whatever it is that you're going to do, ask yourself, is this, is this going to help my neighbor and his eternity? Does what I'm about to do bring glory to God in any way? Does, does my, do my actions and my words, do they help save people? As in not like save them like the man on the side of the road, but an eternal salvation. Paul, in these short two verses, he takes the standard and he raises the bar. And, and, and Paul raising the bar is just trying to get a little bit closer to the bar that Jesus already set. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Just because you are allowed to do something doesn't mean that you should. Just because it's legal for you doesn't mean it serves a good purpose. You should do all the things that you do to help the people around you first. Do all that you do for the purpose of God's kingdom. We have to stop thinking about ourselves. Paul wants the church to know what our purpose is, and that's to reach the lost. And he wants us to shift as a church, as one body with many parts, shift our daily routine and, and our focus of our actions on reaching that goal. And in doing so, we will bring glory and honor to God. So Jesus explained to this lawyer who stood up and, and kind of tried to, tried to trap Jesus with his words. He explains who his neighbor is, but not only the lawyer. If you look in the passage, the disciples are right there. So they, they heard this story as well, and they got to learn who their neighbor is. We, we read on and we see that Mary and Martha and others that we don't even know about are there with him hearing Jesus teach this lesson and how important it is. Understand that as Jesus walked around doing his ministry and teaching, people left their jobs. People kind of went for a few days at least and, and stepped away from their families to learn on foot to follow him, literally waiting just to, just to hear what he's going to say next. They knew. Here's your purpose. This is what I'm talking about today. What are you doing? These people, they, they left things. The, the disciples in particular, you know, they dropped their, their fishing nets, their livelihood, and they left it behind to follow him because they saw how important this is. So what are you doing? Showing up to a building with the word church on it somewhere once in a while, once a week, every couple weeks? He said to them, just because you can do something, just because it's legal and you're able to quote the law back to me and, and justify your behavior, 
the things you do, allowed or not, those things should be done to glorify God and to bring good to your neighbors as well. And now that we know our neighbors, pretty much includes everyone around us. And if your actions and your behaviors don't fulfill those things, why are you doing what you're doing? So now back again, Paul comes to this topic of, of eating food from the marketplace that was sacrificed to the pagan idols. We've talked about this at least three weeks now. This was a big deal. Let's see what Paul says to the Corinthian Christians. And saying it to the Corinthian Christians is saying it to us because we're the church now and this has been passed down to us. So we can take his words and his, his intentions behind what he's saying here and we can put these into our lives. Let's read on verse 25 through 30 of chapter 10. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I mean not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I, am, if I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Paul says, eat anything. That goes so far against everything in Jewish law. To sum up what Paul's saying to them here in this section, he says, guys, go get them. The people, the world around you, they need to hear the message that you know. Go get them. You can't make Christianity exclusive. You can't make it difficult to make people feel inferior to you because you've done something they haven't done yet, because you've understood something they've not understood, because maybe they haven't understood it because you haven't explained it to them. Most people here are believers. Most people who come to, to this church and other churches around the country, around the world for worship time are Christians. First of all, on that note, can you do me a favor? Can you help me with something? Let's change that. When we come together on, on Sunday mornings, our, our, our church um, saying is to reach, connect, and serve. <clears throat> we all know what is in the Bible. And we have the opportunity to learn because we believe the Bible is truth. What we need to do is we need to be reaching out to people who don't know what this book contains. They don't understand the truth that's held in these pages, and we need to be the ones explaining it to them so that they want to know more. And that's where we bring them in together for Bible study, for fellowship, in your home, wherever that is. We need to change the fact that when we sit together on Sunday mornings, we come together for worship, we need to change the fact that we're all the same in here. We need to change the fact. We need to bring in more people who don't understand, who don't believe, so that we have a better chance to show them. Secondly, if you call yourself a Christian, I want to make sure that you know that you're not better than someone who doesn't call themselves a Christian because you aren't. Your job, your purpose, what we read in the scripture here is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Verse 30 in our passage, it says, partake with thankfulness. Jesus tells that lawyer who his neighbor is by showing that we should be compassionate. Paul points out to the Corinthian Christians, these, these meat rules that everyone's so wrapped up in, they're not as big of a deal as you thought they were. This is a big deal. This way of living, this, this kind of switching things around just to love people better than yourself, to love God with everything you are, this changes things. <clears throat> we should simply live with joy and with purpose. And your behavior, your everything you do should line up with what you know your purpose to be from reading scriptures. Now, this, this message isn't a message to tell you to do whatever your heart desires and live for you. If you read the scriptures and you think that it's, it's my world, I'm here to please myself and just to make myself happy, that's not what it says. Uh, there have been a few movies that have come out over the past 10 years. Maybe you've heard something about them. It's the, uh, the Marvel, the Avengers movies. Have any of you heard of any of those? Uh, there's been some in the news here and there. It's kind of a big deal. There are a lot of them. Uh, Loki is one of the bad guys in the very first Avengers movies, and he's called the God of Mischief. He's burdened with glorious purpose. Throughout the movie, his behavior lines up with his purpose. His purpose is just self-seeking. He's the bad guy. He wants to win. He wants to get rid of all the good guys, and he wants to, to rule everything. That's the case with villains in most movies, isn't it, though? What they do throughout the movie, when they're identified as the villain, it isn't a surprise to us, really, because we know they're the bad guy, and that's their purpose. What about you? If you know your purpose, and we've been talking about what your purpose is, but let's assume that we, we get it for now. Let's assume for just a second that we understand our purpose to the people around you know what your purpose is. 
Can they tell by how you live what your purpose is? Would your behaviors, if people know your purpose and if people know your purpose is to honor God and bring glory to him, would any of your behaviors surprise anyone? Do the things you do line up with that purpose? Living with a purpose, that, that changes things. Uh, the, the Avengers, actually the Loki, he has this helmet that has two horns that look like a goat horns. And so that's why a goat was the background image for this week's sermon, because Loki has that uh, burdened with glorious purpose. And purpose was the word, the title for the sermon, and I couldn't stop thinking about those horns. So that's just a little sneak preview into the inner workings of my mind. <laughs> but the, the final Avengers movie, Avengers 4, coming out soon, the, the title is Endgame. And without even thinking about that, my, my third section, the final section here, I, I put end game as, and then I connected for myself later and, and laughed at how immature I really am uh, with that. But the purpose of, of right here, what Paul's talking about, and the reason we come in our end game, why do we do the things that we do? What is your purpose in the end? If our end game is to glorify God and bring honor to him and to, to show people Christ, then everything we do, that's our end game. We should be doing everything to bring people to know him. My purpose in doing what we do here, our purpose in going out and living a life that honors God, our behaviors, what we do, what we expect, the outcomes are all focused on that. And everything should line up with honoring God. When we look at Paul and his actions throughout the New Testament, we can see his life lining up with his purpose. Everything Paul does lines up with his life goals, just the goals that he set after Jesus got a hold of him because the goals before that, he got rid of those goals because those didn't matter. Everything now is about honoring God. I've told you I used to work for an insurance company and it, it paid for college. And as Amy and I got married, that was my, my job to pay the bills while I worked my way through school. Um, I worked in total loss for a few years and I worked the early morning shift. And so um, there would be a lot of claims coming after I left each day. And so my, my purpose each day, I, had, I would come into a stack of new claims that I had to take care of. I came in with a stack of messages I had to return from the day before, and the whole goal of my day was to close out those claims, to call those people back, to get those things off of my desk, to make room for the new ones that would come. And I had to do that with the phones ringing, with questions being asked. But everything that I did on the clock was for the purpose of getting through that stack of files that I had, closing them out, getting going on new claims and new folders. And I didn't spend my day going down to the, the cafeteria area and sitting at a table drinking coffee. That wouldn't line up with my purpose. Getting out of there with little to nothing left on my desk to hang out for the next day to add to it, that's the purpose. And so my actions throughout that workday were focused on that purpose. And that's what we need to do with our lives. As believers, our purpose to love God with everything and love your neighbor like you love yourself, that means telling them. Let's finish the last couple verses of this chapter, verses 31 on. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Think about the things that you've done this past week. Think about some of the things that you did that didn't bring glory to God in any way. Paul writes, give no offense so that they may be saved. Give glory to God and reach out so that the people of the world can be saved with what you know. I think we forget how important this is in our lives. Sometimes we get complacent and we come to church and we, we take the communion. Remember, oh, Jesus died for me. Yay, thank you, Jesus. And we forget when we go out and we look around and we see the people of the world that are lost and we forget how important it is that we do what God calls us to do in going out and telling them. In Luke 19, 10, we read, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. The Son of Man being Jesus, so Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. And if that is good enough for Jesus, that should be good enough for us, right? That's our example. We should be doing the same thing. In John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We're not to judge the world. We're to help the world come into an understanding, that saving grace of what Christ did for them. Jesus came for this purpose, and Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. In John 10, 30, he says, I and the Father are one. And they almost stoned him for that. 
when he tells them who he is, they almost stone him. In John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And what he's saying there reverts back to how God introduced himself to Moses when he said, I am. And they almost stoned him. Jesus told them who he was. He told them what he was going to do. And they almost stoned him. Do you understand how important this is to God, this whole salvation thing, sending Jesus here, this sacrifice, just so people can know him and accept what he offered? Do you see the links that God went to to give us this chance? The fact, sacrifice that he made to save his people. So what are you doing? In everything we do, all of our behaviors need to have this purpose behind it. Our purpose needs to bring glory to God and help the world to know him. We've got to stop going through life mindlessly and start paying attention to the example that we're setting for the people around us because we might be that opportunity that they have to see a glimpse of Christ. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many so that they may be saved. We're going to sing another song together, and it's our decision hymn, and we have to make a decision today. And my prayer is that your decision is to look at your life and to make sure that everything you do is for the glory of God and that purpose is clear to all those around you. Maybe today your decision needs to be to just stay in your seat and talk to God and have some time in prayer, and that's a good decision to make. Stopping for prayer is always a good decision. Maybe, maybe you're hearing this message of Christ and you've never given your life over to Christ and your decision today needs to be to, to really consider that and look at what Jesus offers for you and to set everything else aside. Repent of that former life. Approach him. Ask him to forgive you. Repent of that and, and be baptized and live a new life for him and change everything and redefine your purpose and make that purpose in Christ. Maybe your decision today is that you don't have a church family. You don't have a church that you've committed to publicly to say, I am a part of this church and I want to help this church be the best church that it can be. Today's a good day to make that decision because we're just one body with many parts trying to do what God's calling us to do in this community, trying to serve, trying to show our community, the people around us, who he is and what he's done for us. And today is a good day to make that decision as well. So as we sing, we all have to make a decision today. Take time and consider what your purpose is and make a wise decision. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for loving us. I thank you for bringing us together here today. And I pray you would give us strength to always make wise decisions. God, help us to make the decisions that bring the most glory and honor to you and to always do what you've called us to do and to be who you've called us to be. God, I thank you so much for this church that we can come together here and we can worship you and we can study. But I pray, God, that you would give us strength as we go out from here. Give us strength to, to see the world as you see it, God. And I pray that you would help us to be broken by what we see around us and that we would be so broken that we wouldn't be able to help but take action. I thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen.